My long-awaited book, Astrology Realized, is finally available and waiting for you at Amazon and other online retailers. Get one for you, your loved one, or as a gift. All part of your fabulous journey to understanding astrology. Enjoy. Hello, fabulous friends and fans. Welcome to this episode of Nadia Shaw Productions. I am your host, Nadia Shaw. Thank you for being here. This is a very special episode for me. Dr. Richard Tarnas is the author of The Passion of the Western Mind and for us in the astrological community, Cosmos and Psyche. He is one of our most celebrated academics in our community. Now, a bit of a personal story. I will go back a bit. I remember shortly after I got accepted into my MA program, I got this long reading list, and right at the top was Cosmos and Psyche. And of course, that was the first one I ordered. When it came, I could feel that this book was significant before I even opened it. And reading it was so powerfully influential to me. And I know many, many others who have shared that exact same experience. It is my honor to celebrate with you, Dr. Richard Tarnas. Dr. Tarnas, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for that very kind introduction. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about Cosmos and Psyche. What inspired you to write that? Well, it really went back to the earliest years when I first started taking in the uh, magnitude of the astrological um, kind of uh, revolution in a sense of consciousness when you go from the mainstream conventional understanding of our cosmos to a world in which astrology might have validity where the planets are actually uh, in a meaningful relationship to the moving patterns of human experience that's a such a revelation when it, when I started taking it in in the earliest years this was in the 1970s I was working uh, in California at Esalen Institute with Stan Groff uh, he's a psychiatrist one of the founders of transpersonal psychology and our focus back then was very much on understanding the individual psyche and particularly um, the um, powerful states of consciousness and, and uh, spiritual emergencies and uh, psychological syndromes and so forth and to see the correlations in that way uh, with the planetary movements, the transits to the natal chart was quite a, uh, I mean even though we, you know, Jung had pointed in that direction certainly and we both had great respect for Jung um, it still came as a as a, uh, a, a surprise the sheer uh, consistency and extent of the precise correlations with people's unfolding psychological experience. And then I I started after doing a lot of research in, uh, with um, you know patients and people who were coming to Esalen Institute and going through their transformations. Uh, we then, I started looking at uh, famous individuals' um, lives and to see what was the, what transits did Galileo have when he turned the telescope to the heavens and all of a sudden awakened to a much bigger universe or what, um, what did the birth chart of uh, Jane Austen look like, you know, or what, what did what was Gandhi's uh, transits when he first started in South Africa having his understanding of um, um, the importance of, the, of nonviolence in, in making social and political change. And each, as I started seeing how extensive were these correlations, I then started moving to the collective level to see the big historical um, uh, alignments, like how I'd spent my whole life up until that point studying um, cultural history and intellectual history and to see that all these things that I had learned for years at, uh, in university and in my subsequent studies had a um, consistent, it, it could be illuminated in ways I, I just had not anticipated by bringing in the uh, 
what I would call the archetypal astrological perspective, whereby we recognize the planets as having um, s some uh, underlying cosmic correspondence with deep archetypal principles that can be understood in a platonic way as, as a transcendent um, uh, forms of reality but also in a Jungian psychological way as, as the archetypes of the, of the psyche. And to see the ways in which the whole um, collective psyche of the world during par particular periods like the 1960s or the French Revolution or the um, World Wars or uh, comparably uh, significant periods when you can discern a whole zeitgeist to see that these were coinciding with planetary alignments whose meanings, uh, as determined by generations of astrologers, so well uh, corresponded to and illuminated these historical phenomena, it just seemed like um, the world would enjoy knowing this and it could help um, transform our worldview from a from a more disenchanted cosmos to one in which we we recognize that the the cosmos is ensouled and is informed by um, profound intelligence that's unfolding in in time so i I then set out um, you know, truth be told I wrote passion of the Western mind this history of the Western thought that's used a lot in universities as a as a text, um, I wrote that as a preface or an introduction and a foundation for this astrological work, Cosmos and Psyche. So the two projects together took 30 years. And um, Cosmos and Psyche really sets out the, particularly over the last 500 years, but reaching back even into the, uh, what we, the first millennium BC or BCE, I, I uh, sketched out in a pretty precise way the these major planetary cycles and the major um, shifting epochs of, of the collective psyche as seen in uh, history and um, put it into a book that also contained a certain amount of setting of the stage in a philosophical metaphysical way like how can we even imagine that astrology works because I was trying to be uh, forming a bridge between the world of astrologers who've been initiated into this kind of cosmos, uh, a bridge from them to the mainstream academic world, which is you know where I teach philosophy and cultural history, and uh, and yet for whom astrology is just the the uh, gold standard of superstition in our culture, you know, so I wanted to form a bridge. So it had to be a careful bridge, and that's why it took so many years to do it, but I feel good about uh, how it came out. And so how do you feel about that bridge? I mean, certainly you've been imperative in helping to forge that bridge, but when I think about uh, the effort that it must have taken, the approach it must have taken, and also the inner the inner confidence that it must have taken to share that, look, this is something I want to study, this is something I have to share. Well, you know, I think uh, sometimes a book wants to be written and then it chooses the person who um, whose life has sort of been a preparation to write it, uh, would be an appropriate vessel of it. Uh, I mean, not to inflate this too much, because you actually, I think, a lot of times one feels that one is the master of one's own decisions and you know I certainly did feel like okay I'm, I'm, I feel like I should do this but the motivations that come from deep inside as to why one does something like this that takes so many years I mean that comes from a level of uh, mm, larger purposes are at work I think many writers many artists uh, have that feeling that they're doing something um, in part because they're inspired to do it by some um, daimon, some inner uh, impulse, some karmic uh, obligation. 
and then when the universe is finished with you doing that, it, it drops you uh, like a limp dish rag on <laughs> your, and until you get enough um, energy for the next big project. So it, it, I think some of the conf confidence came from that sense of being uh, called to do it. And I think some of the con uh, confidence came from the uh, how substantial the evidence is. I mean, it's just, I, I have a fairly um, critical turn of mind. And I have to say that even in the course of writing the book, uh, even though I had so much of the evidence was there, I had av available even 25 years ago. But as I went into the final stages of writing and was pulling all the evidence together, even in the act of writing, and more things coming in, and I'm just seeing the, it's a kind of um, spiritual experience and a kind of poetic epiphany to see the, the uh, artistry of the cosmos at work much more than I could have imagined or uh, um, fabricated. It's, 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 it's more of a kind of revelation. And in that sense, the confidence comes from basically I'm seeing it there and I'm writing it down. And uh, it's got a, its own power of conviction c coming into me. So it's easy to convey that to somebody else. It's interesting because you spoke about being led by a daemon, like this is one way to understand inspiration. Yeah, let's, let's make sure our audience uh, knows the difference. Like the, <laughs> okay. It's a Greek word, you know, daemon, or like D-A, either D-A-I-M-O-N or D-A-E-M-O-N, depending on the transliteration. And it, it's, a, it's a, a kind of, um, it's like, almost like a kind of angelic spirit spiritual presence uh, or uh, being within one. It could be even like your deepest uh, part of your deepest self that's leading you into to your, your particular uh, creative uh, gift to the world. Um, so uh, the, the conventional, the Orthodox Church kind of changed that term into from daimon into demon and, 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 and kind of demonized it. But um, James Hillman has written very uh, eloquently about the, 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 the daimon in this sense in a book called The Soul's Code that's really worth reading about how we've all got a kind of acorn in us that is growing into a, a, a great oak tree and that we're born with it. And in some sense, that acorn that's in each of us is picking up Louis Armstrong here in New Orleans, is picks up that trumpet at age 12 and is you know, on his way, he was meant to become a great trumpet player, but it's because that trumpet just falls into his hand and that daimon is kind of leading him to, uh, to become who he is. When I think about your work, I not only think about the subjects that you've covered, but also the fact that you're a really good writer. Just from that technical standpoint, you're able to engage the reader and hold the reader with the way you put the words together. And so I wonder if if inspiration allows the conviction to see the process through in these amazing projects that you've contributed to the world, is that different or distinct from the actual writing process? Or is it that you are also open to inspiration while writing and the, the form comes naturally to you? Um, I would say it's a, I, I have to uh, work um, pretty hard or assiduously to um, create the sentences that I feel right about for the final form of it. So while there's a kind of inspiration in, okay, when, what needs to be written here, and even, you know, for individual phrases and, and sequences of, of uh, sentences will, will come to me in the act of writing uh, just with a kind of force of its own. But um, every sentence that I write, every chapter that I write, um, goes through extensive revisions until I feel good about it. So there's quite a bit of, uh, it's a kind of interaction between the, uh, the inspiration and the discipline of, of, uh, of um, the writer's, um, yeah, the writer's discipline, the writer's skill. It, 
there may be a little bit of a gift that one is, starts out with. I have a daughter, for example, who seems to me to have a much more natural gift as a writer. Like she's already in her 20s writing great essays that I know that I would have to work very hard at that age to have created such the sentences just seem to flow with I'm 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 more of a person who uh, re revises the sentences until they're just until I hear the music of it is just right and so I I, I wouldn't say that I'm I'm one of those kind of automatically genius writers I I it's more of a craft for me to get it right you know but then I feel good about it after quite a bit of work on it, then, okay, oh, that's just how it should be, and then, then I like it. Yes, because I was thinking as you were sharing that, um, I just wanted to be clear to all those out there that to be an academic and even to get any kind of credential, no matter how inspired you are with the subject, there is an element of work that's involved, and there is an element of repetition and practice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a scholarly... Uh, it's almost like this kind of long patriarchal scholarly tradition uh, going back in the, in the to the universities of the medieval period, going back to um, the Hellenistic and Plato's academy and so forth, that long tradition of, of what is um, good intellectual uh, discourse or writing. And yeah, you can't just write um, uh, freely uh, was, there's a phrase in uh, this uh, the world of creative writing, like write like an exhibitionist, but edit like a censor. So you might first just kind of let it flow out, but then, especially in the academic world, you really have to discipline it. Your statements have to be well grounded in evidence, in um, uh, in analysis. There there has to be substance to it. You, it's not like writing. Um, uh, poetry or uh, uh, a, a novel which has its own disciplines but n not the same discipline as the academic uh, scholarly work. Why does it matter to bring astrology back into the academy? Well, I think um, there's a lot of reasons I see it matter. Certainly it would help individual uh, people have a better handle on the navigation of their life intelligently uh, and the capacity to see their lives um, as, in a sense, in, grounded in the cosmos uh, uh, in a meaningful way and that they're not just this kind of random epiphenomenon of, uh, of, of the uh, accidental universe, but there's deeper sense, deeper intelligence that's at work in their lives. and there can even be a, a, a good astrological reading can not only help a person surf the waves of their of their life, um, but it also can help them feel like they belong in this ocean um, that they're surfing in. Uh, and so that's part on the individual level. Uh, on the on the more collective cultural level, which the academic world is particularly crucial for. See, what, our world view that we carry as a civilization has a um, it it shapes the whole civilization in many ways like the way uh, a culture regards the cosmos and the human beings place in the cosmos that informs human activity and if you live in a disenchanted universe then that empowers a very uh, utilitarian mindset in which profit, power, a kind of objectification of the universe, of nature, of the earth, of each other, is much more uh, uh, favored. While well, if you if you live in a universe that is ensouled through and through, and if you see the earth as being a uh, a center, a moving focus of cosmic meaning, then you, you have different motivations for how to live and you feel that you're a participant in a, excuse me, in a, in a larger uh, um, a world of larger meanings than just 
short-term profit and individual uh, egoistic achievement and so forth. It 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 enriches the it it enriches the values within which <coughs> a civilization <coughs> excuse me within which a civilization. Um, uh, acts in the world and academia for better or worse <clears throat> has an enormous effect on governing that world view. It isn't the only thing. There's, re there's religious uh, uh, factors that play a big role in different countries in different ways. Um, there's uh, the arts play, you know, I mean a, a, a powerful movie coming out of um, whether Hollywood or Bollywood is going to have a big uh, can have a big influence on popular culture, but the academic world affects the high culture's um, cosmology, which filters down and shapes a lot of the the way a, a civilization acts. So that's there's a lot at stake. Well, thank you so much for being that or being a leader, a pioneer in that bridge between. Um, what the Academy has been, and now bringing astrology to the Academy. Well, thank you for your um, kind acknowledgement, and yeah, we, we try. And can I just say, it has meant so much to me to be able to thank you in person for the effect that you've had on my career as an academic, but also as an astrologer, so thank you so much. And I know countless people feel the same way. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and it's when one's doing the work on one's own, you know, writing or researching. I mean, part of it, one's just doing it because one wants to. Uh, and I, for many years, I didn't particularly know how far out into the world it might go. So it's a great, um, unexpected delight to know that uh, there are people in the world like yourself who um, are are taking the seeds that are planted or the the uh, ideas that uh, may have helped articulate something that you already felt or you know open up a, a horizon that you sensed was there but now it becomes clear it's it's great that 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 you're there yeah it takes me back to this idea of genius that you've spoken about earlier and how that can lead to an amazing contribution that could be described as great you know if you would trust it if people would trust that mm -hmm. that prompt and i can imagine just from my experience doing my ma that it's it can be challenging to go into the academy with something like astrology but um it's so necessary mm -hmm. yeah um and we've all we everyone's got that that creative genius in them because it's it's the universe's creative genius that we're participating in uh, and and I think a person like yourself you know you you've shown courage to be able to uh, commit first of all to a scholarly program that would uh, in a sense be a bridge program in itself you know that would be um, both academic uh, rigorous and at the same time um, uh, grounded in an ancient, uh, sacred um, form of, of of knowing and participating in the universe, and then for you to then take that educational background, and then as you're doing here, starting to form a bridge into the, to reach more people through through film, through uh, webcasts, and so forth. Is uh, that's a that's a great gift for many people too. I, well, I feel that it is the least that I can do to document uh, these amazing astrologers who are alive right now and have made this amazing contribution to our field because the fact that you wrote that book means that something about you will be immortal. Like for the rest of human civilization, people will be able to go and get this book and gain something from what you put into the world or what you were a vessel for. And my hope is that with this show, in some way I am also documenting and making immortal uh, the amazing people who have contributed to our field. 
So thank you again for being here. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for being here to celebrate Dr. Richard Tarnas with me. If Dr. Tarnas should be in your city, you must go. I've heard him speak, and it's always a very moving experience. You must go. Until we connect again, take care.